Now you guys are quiet, of course. <laughs> well. Ken. For deer in headlights. Ken, oh. I want to know who it is that you, that helped you produce that uh, uh, Wild About Wine CD. Who was that record big wig that um, was in Los Angeles? That was Ray Harris, the great Ray. late Ray Harris. How did you know that guy? Um, I got to know him through, actually Steve Rasmussen he was a friend of his, and I met him in Nashville years ago. And um, we just kind of hit it off because I was still pr promoting music at that time. And boy, did he have some stories to tell of, of yeah. through his life. And we, and we ended up doing that with Rhino and it, it kind of worked out, you know, unfortunately a lot of the songs I wanted, I couldn't get, but you know, it, it was fun. Were they too expensive? They, like, no, they, they, they just didn't want to, you know, I couldn't get, you know, the Stones, Wild Horses, I couldn't get. Um, you two Wild Horses. Well, that didn't, that it wasn't even, I don't even think recorded by then. And then the one I re that I was really hoping to get was uh, the original by, um, uh, Graham Parsons, because he actually wrote that. He wrote that and then traded for heroin with Keith Richardson. <laughs> know all that. <laughs> no, that's that's right. the facts, Jack. That's so, so awesome. Do you remember that CD, Matt? Wild About Wine. Oh yeah, yeah. I listen to it every year. Every year, a couple times. And and uh, my so favorite thing about up. that. And is the is song number one "Wild in the Streets" by the Circle Jerks? Oh yeah, yeah. And that that made a lot of your uh, your like your parents' friends kind of angry, didn't it? I yeah, mean, it, the late Jerry Mead didn't like that very much, but he no. did like Wine Spodiote. He uh, he did like that one. Yes. Okay. There, good. There's good. a little a little something for everybody. But the Circle Jerks. Good. It was it was a, a tad bit offensive to some of the elderly listeners. I just don't know if they're ready for it. I mean, th this was kind of not well. It, you know, Jamaican uh, rap was going, but not not the street rap. I could have you know I could have taken it up a notch or two. You know, a little two pack would have been good, but no. You did have Eka Mouse on there. Well, you know. Sometimes a lot of those guys don't own their own materials. Uh -huh. uh, it's all the songwriters that you got to deal with. How many cases of that CD do you still have in your basement? God, I think I'm down to like a, maybe like 20 of them. I get, I've given them away through the years, you know. I don't even know if I've got 20, frankly. Hmm. You know, I've, I've moved twice in, uh, I've had to, um, I keep trying to reduce my clutter of materials. A wise idea. That's that. You can't always take it with you like King Tut. All right, you guys. Uh, looks like we have some of our regulars on. Uh, once again, hello to Steve and Martha Hewer Hewitt uh, over in Columbus, Ohio. Thanks for joining us. Once again, got a bunch of other people. These are everyone on over on uh, Zoom, of course. I see Michael Higgins in there. Uh, I see Scott Oberg is back again. Uh, Milani, hey, what's happening? Uh, Milani, there. So many people are in and watching, and we've got uh, people joining us over on Facebook Live as well. So thanks so much for joining in over there on Facebook. Um, we're at about five minutes after, so I think we're just going to kick it off um, and invite everybody to grab a glass and listen in. Uh, so once again, welcome back to another Paso Robles Wine Hangout. I'm Chris Toronto with the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us today. We've got a really fun cast of characters uh, here today joining us uh, on a subject that I, I think everybody can agree on that it universally it, it, it is what it is in the wine industry, which is the men mentorship. I'm calling it the mentor show. Uh, much to much like everyone's aha moment in wine, uh, winemakers will typically have somebody that kind of maybe showed the shown them the ropes, taught them everything, or just simply showed them, told them what not to do. Right? Uh, but one thing that everybody has in common today is uh, 
Ken Volk with Kenneth Volk Vineyards. Uh, he's on today with us. And so we're going to be talking about Ken and we're going to be talking about these guys' uh, careers in wine and drinking their wines as well and just kind of having a good time. So thanks so much again for joining us. I want to go around and introduce everybody, give them a quick second to say who they are, where they are, what, what their brand is, and, uh, and a basic hello. I'm going to start with Ken. Ken Volk. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Ken Volk. I uh, have been in the wine industry for 44 vintages here in the Central Coast. Um, I have currently Kenneth Volk Vineyards down in Santa Maria, California. And I was the founder and owner of Wild Horse Winery in Templeton, California, in Paso Robles, and had a really good run there. Used to work for the Shalom Corporation. Um, have been really fortunate to be in the wine industry. Um, center, you know, in the I, Wild Horse was the sixth commercial winery in San Luis Obispo County. Just to give you some idea of when I got established in 1982, and you know, obviously there's been tremendous growth. Um, Chris, how many wineries exist in Paso Robles now? Bricks and we say over 200 now. That, that's what I figured. <laughs> and probably three times that amount in secondary labels or, or yeah. alternating proprietorships or things of that nature. Well, um, it's, it's a pleasure to join you all here. I, I just wanted to make a point that, you know, even though uh, these gentlemen were all great employees for mine, it was very much um, a two-way street when it came to learning because all of these guys are talented winemakers and uh, we don't have some of our talented lady winemakers that, that work with us also but there is um, you know it's a two-way street you know quite often the student is the teacher and um, quite a, they proved it in spades to me and it's a pleasure to be here. Right on. Thanks Kenny. Carl you're up next bud. Okay, so my name is Carl Wicca, and I am now in, I believe, my 18th year as the winemaker for Turley in Turley's Templeton facility. So uh, prior to that, I worked for eight vintages for Ken Volk at Wild Horse Winery. That was from 1994 all the way th uh, through the 2001 harvest. And it was in February of 2002 that I jumped over and joined Larry Turley at, at uh, Turley Wine Cellars. And prior to my employment there at Wild Horse, I also um, worked a vintage at a winery in Lodi called Woodbridge, which at that time was owned by Robert Mondavi. Um, I'd, uh, I was currently enrolled as a fruit science student at Cal Poly in that harvest 1993 um, took the fall off and uh, realized that winemaking was a path that i could pursue i just i didn't want to do it at that scale because uh, in 1993 um, woodbridge winery made i believe six million cases of wine and it was a three shift affair and i got to work uh, the uh, graveyard shift a bunch of really, really interesting characters from the town of Galt, which is a, you know, lots and lots of stories in there. But I was super fortunate in that I returned to San Luis Obispo in 1994 um, and finished school in the winter quarter. And then uh, upon the commencement of the spring quarter, I had no classes left. And that was when I was hired by Ken Volk. So uh, I'm also, like Ken said, very pleased to be here among this group of winemakers. Right on, thanks Carl. Uh, Terry, go next. Awesome, um, I'm also glad to be here, thanks very much. Um, I actually uh, worked my first harvest in 91 at uh, the old Creston Manor um, with Vic Roberts, uh, Victor Hugo. And uh, for some reason, Victor recommended me to Kenny and uh, Kenny hired me in that November right after harvest, so I, I, I slid in right at the at the end of harvest there. And there was like four, five people in the cellar at that point. It was basically, Rodolfo had just left, Fofa had just left. So it was uh, Scotty, uh, uh, Priesty, myself, and actually you, Cannon, because Collins was only there for the harvest and he left and went to go back to uh, uh, Adelaide at the time. So, and I worked there till 94 when I went up to, uh, 
Mendocino um, to work in the Anderson Valley for a while, and Carl slid in right there at that point. So um, uh, it was a really fun, tiny time there um, at, at, at the horse. And then, uh, then I went up to the Willamette Valley. Kenny got me hooked on Pinot. So uh, we used to make the, uh, for, for the Cheval Chavage Pinots in those days, we did one from uh, the old HMR Vineyard and, and one from, uh, I think it was San Benito, wasn't it? Um, uh, probably Biennecito, I think. Biennecito, that's what it was, yeah, yeah Biennecito. And uh, so from there, I went up to Mendo, worked in, in Pino, and then went up to the Willamette Valley, worked in Pino, and uh, then went back to Calera and worked with Josh Jensen there for a number of years. And then uh, I got offered the position through John Priest at, uh, at Adelaide to come back and work with the original HMR Vineyard, which was one of the ones that got me hooked on Pino with Ken in the first place. So I made this whole big circle and uh, came back down. And and, and, and now I'm at uh, Le Vigne, uh making uh, lots of different varietals here in Ken's tradition of uh, 31 flavors of, of varietals. <laughs> right on. <laughs> That's funny. I don't have Malavasia though. I'm really bummed about that. Oh. Uh, last but not least, of course, Matt Travison over at Lenny Colardo. Matt, hello. How are you guys doing? I'm, uh, I got my chickens behind me. I'm trying to, I think we're exciting them right now. And, uh, they're laying an egg. <laughs> we might yeah. be too. I, 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 start, too. I, I, start, I started in uh, the wine industry uh, when I was in college, just uh, by getting invited to go, go to a vineyard, um, James Berry Vineyard back in uh, 93 to help, uh, help pick fruit and that's where the journey kind of started for me uh, we went I went from there to uh, Justin winery as an apprentice in 1995 and worked uh, two vintages there building buildings and, and uh, moving barrels around and, and uh, learning to drive forklift in 97 I, I came over to, to, to Kenny Volk and uh, I, I had met members of the wild horse crew along the way in fact the first time i ever i ever met anybody at wild horse was when i worked at justin winery and our must pump had gone out and we needed to borrow a, a must pump and so uh, i'm not sure if justin baldwin or steve gloucester called you up to borrow a must pump but i ended up having to go on the route with with a, with another uh seller rat and we picked up this pump. It was the old Manzini, the the, the, the great the, Manzini. Yeah, yeah, and and and, and it was um, loosely secured on a pallet and put in the back of Steve Glossner's truck. We proceeded to drive north on the 101 and get to Pass Robles Street, where I was not the driver. The driver taps the brakes and the Manzini comes through the back window of the truck, and I go, "Oh my God, this is crazy!" And I looked then then. Now, now we've destroyed Steve's truck, and, and, and now I'm looking for my dog, Air Dog, and he's not there. I left him at your winery. <laughs> so I had to continue all the way back to, to Justin, work the rest of my shift, and then later that night, I came back, and, and Catherine was, was taking care of, uh, of, of Bear Dog, and I can't remember her, her uh, big German Shepherd, but right, that, right. Was, that was the first time I ever kind of went to the back Corey. side of Wild Horse. And, and, and Corey was that German Shepherd's name. Okay. Corey. Corey, Corey, Corey. That was, yeah. That was, uh, well, about two vintages before that, Matt, um, I had a press go down and Justin let me borrow. This is back when Justin Baldwin was really actively in the wine winery and he allowed me to borrow his press to come out and finish the job that we had going on and so what, what comes around goes around that's the nice thing about past robles people helping each other out when they need help yeah that's the beauty of the wine industry it's yeah the beauty. well i'd say for more so in paso than elsewhere uh, yeah See, and, I, and it, I no anecdotally i can add to that because you know of my experience here working um, in Paso Robles, but also being an employee of a winery that is predominantly up there in Napa. And I can tell you, I can affirm that, Ken, is that the amount of um, collaboration 
and the, you know, the freedom of information exchange is unique to Paso Robles. Yeah, I fully agree. It's, it's, well, we've, when I went away, um, I, and worked, uh, you know, I, I worked in, like I said, Mendocino had some of that. Um, but, uh, you know, no area I, I found has been as, uh, cooperative as PASA. Do you guys think that that it, it, it started early on and now it just continues? I mean, during the time that say Wild Horse or maybe Everly and Vic Roberts was starting and all of those other brands that are kind of original to Paso, do you think it was, it was this, their shared mentality that has now been kind of passed on to the future and, and, and continually being passed on? has to start somewhere and that's probably where it started yeah and i think everybody was uh, striving in, in those days to you know just uh, to make the best wine they could and and everybody was sharing information and uh, it was really a pretty open book uh and kenny was brilliant um just don't drink cadmium in the tasting room that's not a good thing so uh <laughs> <laughs> oh i forgot about that one i haven't <laughs> oh, i still blow it. at night time <laughs> Well, the, the point which I, uh, go ahead, Carl. Okay, I was gonna say on the second or third day of my employment there at Wild Horse, uh, we actually had uh, did a couple of days of bottling. And so um, back then there was only one mobile bottling line and that was owned by Niels Udsen, who is the patron of Castoro Cellars, which is a, you know, like a huge influence on Paso Robles wine that I don't think gets mentioned very often. And the awesome thing was is that it was Niels himself that would show up and he was the operator of the line. And you know, so he had uh, uh, the same collaborative spirit as well. Well, Kenny, you were gonna say? Oh, I was just gonna say is that I can remember back, there seems to be some curse that always happens around um, Labor Day, that as soon as it's like after five o'clock on Labor Day, some major piece of equipment during harvest takes a dive. And I think that's when our press went down, when I borrowed Justin's press. I know for a fact that that happened at Creston Manor, that their crusher went down. And I, which was my crusher at the time that I was taking that over was really tiny. And Vic kind of laughed, like, you're going to use that thing. And I'm going, well, it's better than nothing. And another person who was making wine there, we started using it. And then after about, you know, after we finished his lock, Vic looks over at us and says, oh, you know what? That's a good idea. <laughs> and will keep the show going. But, you know, I think that going back to your part, Chris, in regards to a collaboration with people, I think that a lot of it was that, you know, we're all Team Paso and we're trying to, you know, raise all the ships in Paso. And, you know, that continues. But I mean, in the early days, I mean, all we had was us, so that's what we needed to do. Yeah. I mean, when when uh, Larry bought Larry Turley bought Pizzini, I remember uh, one harvest where where Larry came over and borrowed a, I don't know how many macro bins, but I remember it vividly because because one of my young uh, order McNabs that's uh, now fifteen and a half years old, I remember remember uh, her nipping him during that time, and. Uh, Nothing bad, not, no blood drawn, but, well, but uh, healer. That, that's like a classic example of, uh, of, of, we all, we all pitched in. I used to borrow, I borrowed in, ended up borrowing a must pump from HMR at that time. And uh, this thing was a two piston pump and it was crazy scary and had to hold a broomstick on the, on the heater breakers on it while holding a hose in my other hand. It was 480 volt and I'm standing there running the must pump and if you didn't hold the the the, the heaters in they, they'd click they'd ah. kick out on you and so you you know spray out a macro band hold the heater in while the must pump's going this wasn't at your place <laughs> i hope osha is not listening to this yeah exactly uh, i think the statute of limitations is uh, far since passed uh, no. actually kenny when um uh, that we I, my first vintage at uh, at Crescent, um, I came over to borrow that uh, that the stemmer one or the stemmer went out with uh, I remember Collins giving me shit because I had I, I didn't want to ruin any shoes so I had these white high top tennies on and uh, uh, he kept giving me crap about my white high top tennies and I was like 
you know, because I wasn't wearing boots. It was like, well, I'm a cellar rat. I'm mean, you know, a harvest rat. I don't have anything. <laughs> so, so uh, I think all of you, when when we started talking about this show, you all were like, oh, I got stories, I got stories, I got stories. And I know that you can probably go on forever and off on tangents and everything. And I invite you to, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but I want each of you to think about something that you still do today that you kind of picked up from your days uh, over at Wild Horse with Ken. Terry. They don't, they don't want to bring up bad memories. Yeah, no, so well, there's, there's what was a few the question things. again. So, I mean, for me, um, uh, uh, I, since, you know, I, I've become a winemaker and even along the way, uh, I was really blessed by having people uh, uh, bring me in like uh, right away when I was, uh, you know, I was just started at Wild Horse. Ken would always have uh, when, you know, he and Priest might be blending would come in and he'd be like, hey, try through all these wines uh, and, and uh, tell me what you think. And, and so it was always like, it, it wasn't like you were just in the cellar. You were actually tasting the wines and, and they were talking about blending and what barrels to put in and, and, and really like it, it, it sort of fostered that uh, enthusiasm for wine, you know, and, and uh, so that, um, you know, that's something I try to, I pay back basically by doing that with all, you know, at every one I've worked at, I've really tried to uh, incorporate that into my philosophy and, you know, like bring, bring the cellar guys and have them try the wines as we do it, you know, have, uh, have the uh, knowledge and assistant like totally dive in and, and be part of the blending process and not just like go off in your little room, make your own thing and come back. Uh, Cause I think it's really important uh, for the evolution of, of wine and Paso uh, wine, especially to have that uh, incorporation. So I, you know, um, that, that's something I've always done. Uh, Kenny also taught me how to keep everything nice and clean. But in those days we used bleach. We used to get pool bleach and sprinkle it all over the floor. Hey, what, let's try chloral <laughs> <laughs> And we'd scrub it. We'd have to wear respirators in there because it would smell so strong of bleach. But those floors were immaculate. They were that's amazing. true. And we never had a TCA problem. You know, yeah. Are we story. talking about a white tornado? Yeah. Well, yeah, doing a white tornado. That's yes. what, that was really important. You know, I mean, really winemaking is good quality fruit, sanitation, and, you know, it's like cooking. You, know, you start off with good materials from farmer's markets, your chance of making a good meal is that much easier. And obviously if things are pristine, you know, and you don't burn it, um, move it on. Carlos. Okay, so um, I think that what I still put into practice that I learned at Wild Horse was that um, in a winemaking operation, you really, really need somebody on the cellar floor that can manage on their feet and not do it from an office. And re I mean, you have, you have to be able to understand what's coming out of the laboratory and how to implement it into a cellar practice, but somebody needs to be on the winery floor, uh, boots on the floor. And so um, that particular philosophy has really, I think, served me well, because first of all, you're able to actually, I think, train seller people, seller workers, because you're always bringing in somebody new for every harvest, and they don't understand what the operation is or the flow of work. And it is, uh, it becomes that much more simple to properly instruct somebody on um, how to do things, um, but more importantly, where things can go wrong. And in order to be able to have that vantage point, you really need to have your boots on the floor. And that is something that I continue to do uh, to this day. Well, Carl, Carl, I remember something you taught me, and I think it was by accident, when we used to use large fans for evacuating CO2 out of the tanks uh, during fermentation or, you know, basically post, post firms, you know, as we're digging the tanks. And then you utilized the fan on top of the tank with the tank empty and clean as a small air cooler in the winery. You turn on the jackets on the glycol tanks <laughs> and it would be the poor man's refrigeration. And I thought that was brilliant. And I've continued that ever since. Yeah. A good air handler. Yeah, he, it's a heat exchanger. Yep. 
Matt, you got something to share? Uh, wow, I, I learned so much at, at, uh, at the horse. I mean, I, I, I started there in 97. I, uh, she's from, from we, we, how big were we in 97, Kenny? We, I thought we were 70,000 cases about, and I uh, thought that we that grew. That sounds about quickly. right, somewhere between 60 and 80, yeah. And then that growth period was uh, uh, to about 200,000 was dynamic and was very fascinating for me to be a part of. And uh, from the construction of, of the concrete tilt up in the back to uh, moving barrels all around the county to, to, to facilitate that. I was with, with Kenny Ruby. And, Kenny Ruby. And, Roll and over Stoney, Ruby. God bless. Stony Oaks Trucking. And, and that was such a, a, a cool time to watch that growth happen and, and, and watch us scale up during that time. And, and whether it was uh, where the crush pad was when I started, when we built the, 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 the swale down the, when you built the swale down the middle of, of asphalt that ro rolled down. And, and uh, I just, I think I just learned about logistics and putting things together and realizing how to, to operate in uh, diverse environments and, and it, what, taking, care of, taking care of barrels that are far away from you and, and, and traveling and knowing what you're gonna do with those barrels when you get there. And, and smelling things and my my great memories is you running around that cellar late at night tasting barrels and i'm driving forklift and you coming over what's this and blind tasting me on on different tastes and and i i luckily knew what was kind of in that general direction in the cellar and, and what the barrels could possibly be so i had i i had a little um insider knowledge but but uh, it was always fun and entertaining to, to taste and definitely develops your palate when you're just tasting out of glasses with no idea of what's, what's happening and, and uh, judging for yourself what, what those wines are. So that's you, what you I- You had a name about. while you were on that forklift, didn't you? Yeah, I was a DOF. I was the dork on fork. <laughs> and, uh, I can't remember if Stash like created that language. name. Maybe, maybe it was Priest. I don't know. I but, was- my 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 walking around style and you know because at that point um 97 98 99 the winery was pretty big and there was um at any given time especially during harvest there could have been like five or six different cellar operations going on at once and you know if you leave stash alone for too long he's gonna like start to veer off into some other direction and so you gotta walk over there and make sure he's on track and then you gotta um, go back to the other port, you know, uh, the different cellar in the winery and make sure that Motherwell's in good shape. Yep. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was called the hall monitor. <laughs> you did a good job. You did a really good job. Now, do you guys remember, were you any, either of you there when Phil Kerno decided to take a 240 plug and turn it into a 480 plug? I was there. We called him Sparky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and Phil, Bill went up to the plug, right? And, and yeah. the, the, the ground plug goes down the wrong way. Um, so he and, took uh, the so he, took, he took a screwdriver and he jammed it in the hole uh, to make it go the opposite direction and he plugged it in. And the 240 pump ran really fast for about 15 seconds and then just melt it down. It was <laughs> yeah, I, I remember uh, we've, we've mentioned John Kreese several times here. And for the audience that aren't familiar, I'm talking about the great John Kreese, who's now a winemaker up at Etude, who was actually my first uh, titled winemaker at Wild Horse. Um, and uh, Johnny, if you're out there, um, God bless, but we had some good times. But did anyone was there when we had Bruce, the guy with the tattoos from sweet and sour under his nipples. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was that, the 90, that was the 91 or 90 vintage, was it? I can't say it was like 93, but God. Maybe it was 93. That, that guy was a piece of work. We had him <laughs> yeah. on work, work, he was work, he was released from prison and we were like his first job out of prison. And he wanted to learn, because he feared he was going back to prison. He wanted to learn how to make better prison hooch. Right. <laughs> Was he right? Did he go back? I don't well, know. I, did, I didn't return his phone calls. When he came, when, but his greatest moment of glory is when one of the uh, gray water sumps had, was stopped working. And he had seen it open several times. 
And Scott and I are looking at it and we're trying to figure out, you know, oh, is it the wiring? No, the wiring's good. You know, oh, is that, you know, but why is it running? And so we're looking around, big Bruce <laughs> dives head first into this sump. And we're just like, what the fuck? And he comes out <laughs> with a drowned possum that was backing up a pump on the intake side. And he is so proud with this dead possum in his hand. And Scott and I are looking at each other just like, holy mofo. <laughs> Because we'd spend a lot of time, you know, you can't train people from stupid, but <laughs> you, you can at least give them the basics and you, it never ceases to amaze me, but that was Bruce's last day. Because <laughs> he violated about four OSHA things and he, but he, you know, God bless him. I'm hope wherever he is, he's making the rest of the poor guys in prison that have COVID feel better with his um, prison hooch. He's yeah, logging on now. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. Oh man! Just so you guys know, I did invite John uh, to join us. Uh, he uh, just—I was going to have him come in as a surprise guest. I've been actually watching to see if he might even in over there in the audience part and then I could graduate him to a guest but he's got some stuff going on today he's a little busy so couldn't join us but yeah he's always busy <laughs> yeah mid, mid, middle middle summer winemaking yeah he's, yeah he's, uh, yeah well you know he's a two now right so he doesn't want to waste his time with us castle boys anymore <laughs> So how Jesus. early is it going to be for you guys? What's or how late? Where what what's it look out there for you? Not, nothing's coloring up yet, but things are starting to stop growing. So just about to start here any day now. Just started dropping fruit last week off tops of the hills, and um, that were slowing down. And then bottoms of the hills are still running out a little bit right now. And then uh, I think I think any day now I'll start to see color, and just waiting, 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 waiting here. It's yeah. always. Uh, Always exciting. That's that's a picture of uh, Cherry Vineyard right there. And uh, well, let's, let's pull some corks or taste some wine. Yeah, let's do that. I, 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 you're talking. Tell us what uh, I got a little Cherry Red here. That's perfect. Go. Well, well, uh, Cherry Red is uh, Linné Coloto. It's uh, we've been making it since 1998, and that leaves me to. I wouldn't have started making Linné Coloto without without the help of uh, of Ken here and and. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was the DOF. I, I, I was given an opportunity to, to, to um, produce wines after hours at Wild Horse. And it was a huge privilege to be able to do that. And uh, this is a wine that, that, that stretches all the way back to there and also stretches all the way back to Cal Poly when, when I met Justin Smith and, and Pebble Smith was making cherry red at that time. And uh, we'd pass it around the pool table, swigging it, uh, just because that's how that's how we drank wine in, in the local neighborhood. It was it was a beverage of of hedonistic self you know exploration and and learning learning to make wine starts in the vineyard. It took me a long time to figure that out, but um, cherry red, dry farmed, head trained, two uh, two and a half acres, planted in uh, 1977, and owned by Elmer. Uh, owned at, uh, planted at, by Elmer and Mary Cherry. Uh, now it's been passed on to, uh, to Glenn Cherry, uh, takes care of that property now. And I, I do all the farming on this, this, this two and a half acre vineyard. It was the first time that someone threw me the keys to the family Cadillac and said, hey, learn how to farm, learn how to prune, learn how to do all this uh, leaf pulling, you know, any, whatever I do up there every year um, to maintain that property. And, and uh, to share it with you guys is to share you know what you started kenny and and uh let me jump in there matt because again because of the benevolence of ken he allowed me we were pretty busy if i recall and that was the first pick that you and justin did for the uh infant lenny coloto label and i he allowed me to uh bounce from my duties to go over there and help you guys pick because you didn't that's, even have a crew really that's it was, right it's yeah, like volunteer justin were the crew well, you know, yeah. who, you know who else was on the crew was Utilio Busi. And Utilio was on that and Tony Utilio probably Utilio was on the crew and he was really old at the time. And uh, right. um, the, uh, I remember it vividly because he 
was talking to himself, which I guess that he was like apt to do. And I thought that he, he was like on the next vine over from me and he kept talking and I kept looking at him and saying, huh, pardon me? And it took me about three or four vines to realize that he was actually just talking to himself. And Is he speaking Basque? Uh, it, it, I don't, yeah, it certainly was in English. And that's yeah. why I kept asking him what, <laughs> huh, pardon me? And yeah. Uh, yeah, but that was, I, I um, whenever I see um, Lenny Coloto on a list at any restaurant that I'm at, or, you know, it's such a cool memory. I'm like, I was there that uh, the very first pick from that brand. Cheers, my brother. Cheers, cheers, guys. Cheers. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I've got, I've got this, I've got two of the original bottles. In oh, my yeah. Of that's, the, that crazy that's, label. Uh, not of uh, James Berry and uh, and and Will, do you have Willow Red or do you have the uh, the, the Cherry Red? You know, you know I because because honest, you guys see those that crazy label and I'm not even sure, certain what's in it, but I figured I could never drink it. You know? <laughs> and, uh, um, it Got a little hex out. on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe something. Who knows? That was a it was a good time. I mean, you allowed us to explore and and I was immature and didn't know everything about making wine and still don't. And uh, it's just uh, allowed me to, to have a, a spot in your life on that, on that journey. And, and that's been awesome. I mean, where it's led me and, and, and um, I just can't thank you enough, but it's uh, yeah. So cherry red, it's blended with uh, Syrah, a little bit of Moved and that helps balance it because uh, dry farmed head trained Zinfandel can be really acidic, it can be really, uh, really high in alcohol, really high in alcohol too at times because the sugars get high. It's dry farm. There's no irrigation. But today, that's like the the most the purest form of of grape growing, winemaking, and and create creating a a vintage for me is about about that like uh, play with nature that really doesn't have that influence of of water. And uh, Carl, Carl does that at Turley all the time. It was all about it. Yeah, Carl, we've got a okay. bottle from you as well. Okay, so that's, um, so what I, uh, I gave to Chris was, <clears throat> that's the first and possibly only time that we're gonna be bottling that particular wine. So um, uh, you, just to backtrack a little bit, Turley Wine Cellars since like 1993 has been bottling Zinfandel from old vineyards um, uh, throughout California. It started um, just in Napa, but slowly expanded from there. Um, and there are lots of them. There are, uh, you know, there are pockets all over Napa, all over Sonoma, um, all over Contra Costa County. Um, San Benito County, awesome. and then there are several that are here in San Luis Obispo County. And generally what we've done over the course of the decades is just uh, as uh, fruit becomes available from these old vines is we like to like take it out for a test spin, so to speak. And we'll make the wine um, and we won't put a vineyard designate on it in the first vintage and the old vines has been a, a vehicle for us to actually market that wine. And it's um, up until 2018, it's always just had a California appellation because there's been wine from all the previously mentioned counties. However, in 2018, um, we had a really, really abundant crop and the, you know, you, uh, the uh, old vines in its traditional sense with the California appellation that program was fleshed out. We had as, as many, you know, uh, as much volume as we wanted to bottle. And so we decided, hey, let's do this so we could sell it just directly through the tasting room. And we uh, created a 500 case blend. And so um, it is, it was eight barrels of Pizzenti Zinfandel and then four barrels of Uberoth Zinfandel, four barrels of Dante Ducey Zinfandel, and then four barrels of what we bottle as Amadeos, but it's actually, you know, locally and internally, this vineyard is still referred to as Martinelli. And so um, two of those vineyards we own, the Pizzeni and the Martinelli, which you know, Larry Turley bought the Martinelli vineyard from the family that planted it 
in, uh, in uh, 2014. So we've owned it for about six years now. And then uh, Dante Ducey is purchased fruit from the old section that surrounds Dante's home, which is like 15 acres planted in the late 40s. And then the Uberoth Vineyard, which is really not that far uh, from the Cherry Vineyard, which we just tried. And so what, what we have here is uh, a wine, it's like 100 years in the making, because again, the, the Pizzani Vineyard in, uh, was planted um, in 1922. So it's coming up on 100 years old and all these other vineyards are around the same age. So um, it is a representation of old Jai Farm Zinfandel from Paso Robles. I used to get cool. fruit from that old Martinelli uh, vineyard. I, Just before you guys bought it, it was... It was uh, I used to get it as a home wine maker. Yeah, really? Yeah. It was, uh, when you did it with your baseball bat? Yeah, well, Charlie Pablo and I used to get that fruit, um, you know, back in the day. And, but it was a trash vineyard. I mean, it was, well, I shouldn't say trash, but nobody was taking really good care of it. And uh, we, a shame. we'd make a couple of passes and, and get it. And uh, but that was fun. Um, yeah, yeah all, you, all you Zen freaks stole all the good Zen. I had to go north to Lime Kiln Valley to find some old vine Zen to farm. And, you know, so, but that's a whole other story. Terry, tell us about this this pinky LaRue here. Yeah, well, uh, so I started here in August and uh, um, uh, they want, you know, the rosé that they had traditionally had done was from uh, here at Lavigne was from Saran and, and we have all the San Giovese and, you know, it, it's bright, it's acidic and uh, so, uh, and, you know, Walter, the owner is Italian. So I was like, I, I talked him into making uh, uh, the Sanji Rosé and it's actually, we just got a, a great score on that from uh, Sunset. So hopefully it helps sell everything good. <laughs> so uh, Sunset Magazine liked it a lot, um, but it's, uh, it was really fun. It's, I did it uh, traditional, um, you know, I, I soaked it for probably about 10 hours on skins and then we pressed it off. So we made it to be an actual fan, you know, you know, a rosé. And then I did, I did pull a signe from our regular San Giovese. Um, and it had a little bit of color. So I blended a tiny bit of that back just to round out the color to get it to that sort of uh, Provence color that I was shooting for. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, you know, the really fun thing about coming here to Lavigne is it's got, it's a really old winery. I'm used to old wineries, but it's got all the tools, you know, and, and uh, we've got everything here. We need to make really fun wine. And, uh, and, you know, uh, I've been really happy. So it's been, it's fun to, to land and be just sort of comfortable where you're at enjoying it. So, but the, the wine, uh, it's crisp, fresh. It's, it's Sangiovese and, and, uh, you know, uh, Ken Tommy never shy away from any varietal, so uh, no matter what it is, so I'm ready for anything. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's big. Uh, Chris, well, what, what's going on here? Um, are we going to like, you know, do, we can't do a body slam here. We can't, you know, how do you, uh, how do you wrap this thing up or? Oh, we're not wrapping up yet. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Well, well, Matt, Matt, Matt wanted to get a little extra airplay because I noticed I got two two wines from him. And yeah, well, but I but Kenny, to, you, you haven't talked about your wine yet, though. Yeah, we still haven't had Kenny yeah. wine. Okay. On, well, Kenny. Okay. Oh, of course, the best for last. No, it's right now. What, we're, what I have for you, gentlemen, is a 2013 Blau Frankish from Pomar Junction Vineyard, and for. Those in our audience and aren't familiar with Blau Frankisch, Blau Frankisch is one of the great grapes of Austria and as well as Hungary, Keiko Frankisch in, in Hungary and Blau Frankisch. Um, I would tried a number of these up in Washington state where it was called at that time and it's still called Lemberger and talk about a non-marketing starter trying to sell a wine <laughs> called Lemberger. Um, I spent a lot of time with this variety. I was first a plant in Paso um, at Wild Horse, but I figured Lemberger was a non-starter. So I spent a lot of time um, with the great Bridget Bowles who worked for our winery, doing paperwork for, at that time, what was the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Sounds like a fun place for Trumpies to work, but <laughs> it was, um, I had to get that dig in. Um, <laughs> it was 
they didn't recognize it as a variety. And so I had to you know, provide all the paperwork and I did Vermentino at that time because Neil had just brought in Vermentino to Tablas Creek and there was no one recognizing Vermentino and it, that our government didn't recognize it. They recognized it from foreign countries but they wouldn't recognize it in the United States. And since there, I've done six different varieties. I've gotten them recognized by our country, you know, Altriga Nationale and others, but keeping with this Blau Francish, um, Blau Francish is part of the Gauss Blanc Pinot Noir prodigy of grapes. And so it is related to Pinot Noir. It is related to Milan. It is related directly to um, uh, about six different Pinot derivatives. And uh, to me, it reminds me of somewhere between Pinot Noir and maybe a very light Zinfandel. Um, it's kind of got fruit, spice, berry. Um, it's, a, it's a fun wine. If you try that other pink wine, that's actually made from a juice bleed from um, uh, Blau Francois from a more recent vintage. Um, but, but when I sold Wild Horse, I took cuttings off of this and had my friend Dana Merrill plant it at the Pomar Junction Vineyard, and that's actually where this fruit came from. But it, I, I really like Blau Francois. I think it's a fun wine. And for you penophiles that haven't tried Blau Francois, give it a go. You know, there's only, you know, 20,000 vinifera wine grapes in existence. And so life's pretty short, you know, um, I believe that in the right place with the right production techniques, you can make a lot of interesting grape varieties. And that's why I love Italy and I love, um, you know, every 50 miles you're getting something else that's fun. And, you know, whether you can sell it is a whole nother question, but it's, it, it's, you know, I've been a one hand clapping out there a lot of times in my life, but it's fun. And um, uh, go out and check out Blau Frankish, whether it's domestic or elsewhere and uh, fun stuff. You brought some, a lot of fun varietals in, Ken. Um, but I remember that my first harvest working at, at the horse and walking through the cellar and when we first time ever smelling Malavasia and uh, it was fermenting in the tank and it had the, the fermentation almost had a slight green hue to it. Uh, but whenever you walk by the tank, it it smelled like you were walking like through a field of flowers. It was just absolutely incredible. And whenever you got anywhere near that tank, it was just so beautiful and pungent. It was just you'd smell it throughout the whole that whole area. So uh, just some, you know, that was like one of the grapes that it was just like it was really strange. I never heard of it before, and um, at that time, and and uh, it was just you know it was, it was a white wine, it was crisp, fresh, and really fun to drink. So, you know, and, and all those other varietals, I mean, you never shied away from a single varietal when we, when we were at the horse. And we were a small, I mean, you guys were talking about the big growth. We yeah. went from about 25,000 cases, 20,000 cases to about 60,000 cases. Cause that's about when you came on, right? Carl was around 60. Yeah. The, it, my, my, um, my spiel on that whole thing is that in 94 and this, I was hoping Ken could, kind of verify I think it's about right but I've always said that in 1994 the horse was making around 40,000 cases and then like it, Matt had said earlier the last vintage that I worked there in 2001 we made enough wine to bottle 200,000 cases so in eight vintages that's 500 percent growth which is you know well you that's know, that's was the area you could do that yeah I mean it, it was butt at it it was awesome. I mean, it, it was the, you tell that to anybody from any type of business, you know, not even, um, you know, in the wine business specifically and to grow 500% in eight years is unbelievable. And, you know, it was, there were times when it was really difficult. I remember there was, um, there was huge hurdles to clear in the 97 vintage because we had, as a, as a business committed to a bunch of different vineyards that were coming to the winery for the first time. And we knew that we we're going to need more fermentation space, but there really wasn't that much concrete pad space in order to accommodate all the fermenters. And so it, we just had to make do with what we could. And, you know, so it was, yeah, there was, we had to craft all these, do you remember the hose bridges, Matt? 
I mean, that yeah. would yeah. be barrel, having, barrel racks over the top of the doors. Yeah, exactly. Oh, God. I mean, it, it was just, there were so many different hurdles that we had to clear while grapes were arriving. And it, um, it was really, uh, you know, a, a huge lesson in, in actually thinking on your feet. But then, you know, the other cool thing is that we, while employees of a business, got to watch the construction of a tilt-up concrete um, facility. And uh, well, how big was that, Ken? How big is the tilt-up concrete? Is you know, it? I get to ask quite often. I want to say it was 30, 50, by a, 50 by 150. I, I, okay, so I, I mean, it's many, it's 10,000 square feet or bigger. It was big. And I had it at 28,000 to 30,000. Okay, okay. So well, I'm gonna go with know, 30. Ma'am, I'll go with your number. I, I just remember that was one big ass thermos. Matt, yeah. was, the barrel room. Matt was the barrel room manager. No, he was this yeah. cute little kid. Yeah, yeah, was Ferreira. I was a joining us, but he doesn't have his camera on. Work. How are you guys Chris, doing? Turn on your camera. I don't know how. I've been trying to log on for 20 minutes. You look really young. <laughs> it's it's yeah. using a flip phone. <laughs> I like the stuffy. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what Adrian's done here. You got to go to the bottom left. Oh, Chris, Chris is here? Mr. Yeah, Chris, Chris is here. Are we getting photobombed? Where is he? I, I, I'm Zoom bombing for the first time. Well, this is uh, Biagio. Let's, let's hear from uh, an Italian producer. How are so, you guys doing? Uh, so I don't see Chris up there, but that's probably better. He's not really that handsome. His kid's better looking. <laughs> Can uh, you hear him? I thought I did. Chris, are you there? there? How are you guys doing? Good. Good. How are well, you doing? Chris was one of our early, um, if I can speak here, was our, what my second, um, my B team viticulturalist that became A team viticulturalist under the great late Scott Welcher. Correct. Well, Matt, I heard you chime in about the opportunity uh, Ken gave you, and I wanted to reach out and just uh, say thanks for the opportunity you gave me when you let me make wine there after I left Constellation. Yeah, appreciate absolutely. that. Absolutely, that was that was. Oh, well, uh, you know, we we talked about that earlier about passing it along and and having everyone and and uh, it's important. It's really important. Go ahead, Kenny. Well, I was going to say with the audience here, um, you can see how I've, you know, had a very liberal mind to hire the handicapped. And <laughs> these gentlemen here. Um, we allowed we, to flip we, you off? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, no, we, we, with all, you know, it, I had a really good crew and um, you guys are, are been super, you know, I can't tell you how much I love you all. And I'm so glad you guys are prospering on your own and, you know, in this one fucked up crazy world that we live in today. Right on. How, how well said. Um, Chris, so we, we talked a little bit about uh, some of the things that we, they, they I should say, uh, kind of learned and, and took on and continue to incorporate into their making lives. And I'd love for you to share a story or a something from your start over there with Ken and, and maybe how it's still uh, a part of your winemaking life. Well, gosh, um, my entire brand is based on uh, varietals that you can hardly pronounce. And I, um, I just feel fortunate that, um, you know, Ken was um, very forthgiving with his knowledge and the, the varietals that he let us play with. And I, I just fell in love with all the varietals that were not mainstream and uh, would have never guessed I can make a business out of um, producing Italian varieties here on the Central Coast. Well, Chris, you forgot you you met your wife and uh, at Wild Horse, and as well as Carl. I'm not the I'm not the only one. Yes, okay. and let's. Twenty one year, twenty one years we've been married. There you go. Well, you know, and and some progeny here um, representing. Um, Bellagio there and uh, it's all good. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, when when uh, shortly after I started, Kenny let me move. Uh, actually, Scotty and, and Karen were living in the back uh, apartment 
and uh, uh, they bought a house, so they moved out to the house. And so I asked Cam if we could move in. And Kath, uh, my wife, is still in school. So we uh, we had Dylan, my uh, oldest son, who was one year old. And so we moved into the back apartment, and we sponge painted. I don't know if you guys remember it. Uh, we sponge purple. painted the uh, wall purple. And uh, it was there for ages. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ken had the guys help me build the fence around. Wasn't, your son, wasn't uh, your son conceived in that location? No, he was already he was already born, but he okay. grew up there. Okay. And he used I, to come over. I stand used, corrected. Yeah, he would come over to the winery, and and uh, the guys would prop him up on the barrels. And as we filled barrels, he'd jump from barrel to barrel when he was like three, and uh, you know, because he'd just walk across the the little island and be at the back as we were filling barrels. And uh, Scotty used to carry him around on the shoulders because they had to. Scotty and Karen hadn't had any children yet, and I think Scotty was rehearsing. So he'd grab him, carry him around on the shoulder. So he was like a little winery mascot in the back. But uh, uh, anyway, you were always so gracious on that. And uh, um, just so it was, just, you know, such a nice little spot to, for us to grow. It was a little one bedroom, but it was killer for what we needed at the time. And, and we always appreciated that. And then when I left to move up north to, to go back up to Mendocino, um, I was driving away uh, in my Volkswagen bus, and uh, and Scotty and Priesty were there with you. And Kenny goes, "Wait a minute! Wait a minute!" And he runs in the back and he runs out with a fire extinguisher because I I knew he thought it was going to catch on fire before I got up there. Uh, <laughs> and he gives me a fire extinguisher to take off with me, so just to make sure I was going to make it all the way up there. It was classic. So, oh, hey, hey Terry, Ken, I want to jump in here. I'm going to show you this picture right here. So this is uh, myself and my, my uh, now late dad, and then an infant, which was Curtis, who was born um, in the harvest of 2000. And then uh, Curtis is gonna come around here right now and he's gonna show his face in the, uh, in the camera. There you go. Hey, Curtis. <laughs> there we go. Go Kansas. <laughs> Two weeks awesome. away from going, uh, returning to Kansas to resume university education. Awesome. Represent. Cool. Represent. Represent. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that Dylan now is uh, actually up in Walla Walla, Washington, working for uh, Figgins and Leonetti. So there goes the, the tradition, Ken. Uh, and Ken, Kenny uh, Chase Welcher is working, working for me now. Oh, dear and, God. Uh, just, last, just last week, I, I had my daughter and Chase working together, another generation. Here we go. Right on. Well, you know, it's so strange. My kids didn't get either the fishing gene or the winemaking gene. I don't think they wanted to work that hard, but they're great <laughs> kids and have their own pursuits and everything else. But um, it's the, you know, it's crazy, but it, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, that you're, everyone's healthy here. And I, you know, I, I just cry every day thinking about 137,000 people dead from coronavirus in this country um, and a lot of that could have been you know if things were more properly handled and if we had a more competent leader of our country we could probably have had that much less you know it's hard for me to think in terms of third world countries having a lower death rate than we have and it's just getting started yeah yeah just getting started and uh yeah, yeah. I, well, I guys I, uh we are getting right near the end of our show. And Chris is getting worried about the Trumpers coming, getting their guns loaded. <laughs> yes. no, I, just sure, though, <laughs> I just want to make sure we got that one last thing. The one last thing that I wanted, that I told everybody I wanted to be able to, to, to mention, and we've kind of gone that route, is now the people that are coming out from under you guys. So you guys are now the new mentors, let's just say. So under Matt, under Chris, Terry, Carl, carrying on the Ken Volk traditions, uh, I think we can expect to see people who've already worked with you, already working and, and out in the industry, or maybe potentially some of the kids and whatever. But are, are there any shout outs of people that are making some great wine that had a, a, a bit of a start under you or with you that we should mention? Who wants to go first? Why don't you, you're talking. All right, I'll go. Um, you know, I. I I, I had to learn how to teach and, and how to be patient. And I've never been very good at that. I, 
I tend to be want to get it done and, and, and move on. And, but I've taught a lot of kids over the years and, and in recent years I, I've been uh, flattered to uh, take uh, uh, Austin Collins, boo, uh, Neil Collins son and, and take him as an intern for two vintages. And then also uh, Camille Cherry from, uh, from Via Creek Cellars, Chris and Joanne's daughter and, and, uh, and have her for a harvest and, and, and just, pass on that knowledge. I have uh, Ryan Peace, uh, who has Pax to Terre. Um, he also has, uh, has learned and grown and, and uh, sees things. And it's just nice to kind of pass on your, your mentality and, and your, your beliefs and, and show them how, how wine can be made. So, and without Kenny, Kenny, all that fruit that used to come through the doors, I used to get so high on sugar that, that I, I was eating every grape and trying to find all the varieties and trying to go, oh my gosh, by, by, by I don't know, three in the afternoon after eating all that sugar, it was crazy. Good times. Right on. <laughs> right on. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here and uh, something that Matt just said reminded me that um, we used to actually, or Ken used to actually have beer delivered by the pallet during yes <laughs> um the pacific beverage company was no, 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 on the regular route they would come by and it, it got to the point where um we realized that we weren't drinking it fast enough <laughs> because we started to accumulate beer and so then we had How to that possible in the winery and it was good beer it, i mean that's the thing yeah. it was it wasn't just beer kenny would get it uh pallets of like Mixed pellets and, and then when we were there, it was like Rhino Chasers and Red Tail and uh, you know from Mendocino Brewing Company and uh, oh, Bell what Havens. About the Belgians? And, yeah, the Bell Havens. I'm getting oh. there. It's like and, and and I mean you'd be on top of the the press and you know and someone would be saying, "Hey, I'm going for a beer. Do you want something?" And all these voices from all over the winery, but like, yeah, I'll have a I'll have a Red Tail. I'll have this. I'll have that. They come back with a handful of beer, cold beer, and hand them out to everybody. And you know that was like. <laughs> That was common, and, and I think you spent. Uh, and there's only you got to remember, there's only a handful of us. And when I was there, he spent over two thousand dollars wholesale on beer for us for the harvest. So that's wholesale. I want to jump back in on the on your topic, Chris. Was um, I have two people specifically uh, that that I, I look back on, and I and I feel like I did a pretty good job mentoring them. And we, so there's um, Jeanette Ortiz, who is now uh, the, she's either the assistant or the associate winemaker, um, for a, a, a really good brand down there in, um, uh, Lompoc. And then there's, uh, Drew Ninao. Um, he is the winemaker for Onyx and now he's actually got his own brand called Ninao Wines. And, um, he has leased the tasting room from, uh, for Nadeau. And so he's going to be opening up a tasting wow. room here pretty quick. Um, sea Smoke is Jeanette's brand. So uh, a, actually a, a really good, very reputable, internationally known Pinot producer. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think kind of one of the hot and upcoming brands of Paso in Onyx. Absolutely. That's cool. Right on. Thanks, Carl. Terry, you got one to share? Yeah, just, uh, well, a, a, a local one is uh, Zach Rains uh, from DeBose Winery. And Zach, uh, Zach started with me when he was 19. Um, he and Lalo were both 19, and Lalo's the cellar master out at, uh, um, um, well, here in Paso anyway. But uh, anyway, he, uh, they, Zach uh, was 19. He, my, I, did, I do the dried stem thing, and uh, Zach was uh, first day uh, on the job. I said, okay, I want you to take all these stems and sprinkle them out on this concrete pad, and we're going to dry them out for four days. So. You know, of course, it was like a 98 degree day that day. So he had this big hat on. He's sprinkling the, the stems out. And I'm sure he thought he was being hazed. But uh, uh, he did it. He was stoked on it. And, and it was, you know, just all part of it. And, uh, and he's been, uh, you know, he, he was always, it was really fun. Because, like, when I bring him in to blend with us, you know, um, and I'd have him, like, put the percentages together, uh, he'd always have, like, one little side thing on the, uh, and I, I asked him one time, I go, so what's, what's the side glass? And he goes, oh, well, it's just something I thought might be really fun. And he was sort of really shy about it. I was like, well, show it, you know, let's see it. So it was, it was really cool to see that he was like really thinking about it and, 
and 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 going for it. So shout out to Zach and and the DeVos family. So right on. That's cool. That's awesome. Chris, are you still there? Do you got anything to share on this one? Looks like you're muted. I can unmute you. In the meantime, though, I don't know if you guys are looking at uh, some of the chat over there, but there's lots of uh, lots of stuff over there with people saying they used to carry the Negret uh, over in Ohio and uh, from Ken Volk, and they loved it. Hey, I still uh, make it. You still <laughs> All right, right and on. Actually, on a sad note, Ron Saletto, Don Ron Saletto, one of my oldest growers, literally in time and in age, passed away this last Sunday. And so, a little to Joe, to old Ron Saletto, Don of San Benito. Gangster. <laughs> totally. And he was the last CFO of Almond and Mountain Winery in San Benito back in the day and super nice guy. But, you know, in regards to, you know, sharing information with other kids and things like that, I, I spent a lot of time with, with Cal Poly trying to get them to put a wine program together of which very slowly they put it together. But I, in 19, um, excuse me, in 2004, um, funded the, the pilot winery, which is still the only teaching facility there for winemaking at Cal Poly. They got the new facility, it's pretty close. Hopefully it will be open before the end of, of next year. Um, but it's, it's interesting. I mean, I've been really fortunate to have a lot of, lot of really good people work for me. And when we used to make the Cal Poly wine and Paul Fountain, I mean, I had a lot of great mentors, but just the people in Paso I'd really like to recognize is the late George Moldar and Charlie Pablillo, because those guys are really sweet guys and we had a lot of fun together. Cool, right on. Not to mention Mr. Surrett, Dick Surrett. God bless. Yeah. Cool, you guys. Uh, we're running out of time. We're actually about seven minutes over. Thank Good. you, everyone, for taking the time. Uh, I thought we were maybe even going to go a little longer, uh, uh, even than that. But uh, but I'm glad that we are actually. You guys are being awesome and sticking to time. So I appreciate that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ken, so much for being a part of our show today. Carl Wicca from, from Turley, Terry Colton, Lavigne, Matt Trevison over at Lena Coloto, and Chris Ferreira. Thanks for still jumping in with us uh, from Clessy. Really appreciate your guys' time. Uh, and cool, right on. Appreciate it. Good See you, Chris. Cheers, guys. Salute. Let's do one of these in person one of these days. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know. I've got some nice wines open here. I think I'm going to go out and invite the neighbors over. <laughs> <laughs> right on, Ken. All right. See you guys. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye.